We're going to be looking this morning, carrying on in our Nehemiah series, and this morning is, is kind of where stuff starts churning and hitting the road and becomes very real for some of us, because we're going to be looking at this whole thing of opposition. Opposition, the, the enemy opposing God's plans worked through his people, and so the enemy opposing us. I think for some of us, it's going to be a realization, ah, maybe what I've been experiencing is opposition. For others of us, we're going to struggle because the idea that there's, there's Satan and hell, we're just, we haven't quite got our heads around that. And so I hope this morning's going to inform us a little bit to be on the lookout for his activity and give us some tools of what to do. But really, it's going to be a morning where we look to God. We're going to land in that place. The kind of crux of it comes to, is Jesus who he said he was? Because if he is, that's where we run to. That's where we gain strength. That's where we come to to overcome. But we've got a little journey to get there. So first of all, um, we've got a serving fair going on afterwards. It's a great opportunity on your way out as you're talking to just see some of the teams that are going on here to make Sundays happen, to make midweek happen. And you can just ask questions. There's not going to be loads of pressure. If you know I want to join this team, then feel free to sign up. But if you want to put your name down to actually receive some more information, because I realise just hearing it on one morning might be a bit of a, you know, overwhelm me. But if you want to find out more, then please just register, let them know you're finding out more, and they'll be able to send you more information. I I kind of have got this new hero as of last week from scripture. I don't know if you picked up on the name Malkajai. It's this name, Malkajai. And and he's kind of in the middle of what Simon was preaching last week, Nehemiah 3. And he's just uh, right in the middle there. And you, you may have skipped past him, but he's the guy who was overseeing the rebuilding of the dung gate. How good a job is that? overseeing the dung gate. I'm sure when he was assigned that task, he was kind of thinking, oh, I'd have loved the, the, the tower of ovens. I'd have loved that one. Or, or maybe the fish gates. I'd have preferred that one. But the dung gate, I mean, that place stinks. Why do I have to rebuild that one? But he's my hero because he really doesn't come across as a hero. He's a name in a list. And if you read through it, you'd easily miss it. And yet without his work, without his diligence, without him saying, yeah, I'm going to serve, I'm going to do my part to the rebuilding of the wall, you could have finished 99% of the wall, but if that part's missing, the whole part, the whole thing fails, doesn't it? It's the weakness in it. And yet he served God for the dung gate. <laughs> imagine all things. And I know some of our serving teams look like behind the scenes, some in front. I just want to encourage us, this, this church, we're a community, it's in our name, we're a family, And families work best when mum doesn't have to do all of the cooking, all of the setting up, all of the washing up, all of the preparation, when the family takes part in it. And I just want to encourage you, if you haven't yet found a place where you can serve, please have a little look and see. And I'd also encourage you, if you're serving in five places already, please walk straight past. (laughs) We we don't want to bolster up this church with a few working really hard. Um, That doesn't help. We want you to be able to serve in one place really well and, and enjoy what you're doing. So let's be frank at the start. When we come to opposition, this is a very real thing. It's a very real and serious moment. In a week when 50 ministers in our country resign and declare their opposition to the prime minister, I think we could say that we have opposition going on in our lives. In a week where that very prime minister, the country's highest public office, resigns as there is no other way to continue, I think you'd agree that we see opposition working its way out in our world. And lest we forget, as I'm reminded by the WhatsApp group that I've signed up to, hearing from Victor and Polina, there is still a war going on in Ukraine. This, this right up front opposition going on and just looking through your news feed, it looks a bit like reading through Nehemiah sometimes. I'm reading through Nehemiah and, and it's like a third of the book is given over to recording some of the opposition that they go up against. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke about making a plan. We started uh, with Kat uh, imploring us that if he's given us a vision, if he's laid on our heart something, that holy discontentment, do you remember that? And then from that place, what do we do? Well, Nehemiah then steps into following God and starting to make a plan. And from that place, I would say, that's when opposition comes. We'll today see what it's like when opposition comes against the plans and purposes of God, because it always, always does. When fighting Evander Holyfield, a reporter asked Mike Tyson what he thought of Evander's fight 
uh, plan. You see, Evander had been uh, recording and, and really saying that he's got this fight plan that he's going to put against when he fights Mike Tyson and it's going to overthrow him. And Mike Tyson was asked, well, what do you think about Evander's fight plan? And uh, you may have heard this. Tyson famously said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> Everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. And this is the part of the story where Nehemiah and his people get punched in the face. And there's going to be a time if we've got plans and purposes where God has laid on our hearts, where we're going to come against opposition, and it's going to be like being punched in the face. And what do we do at that point? So Nehemiah 4. We're going to read that together. If you've got your Bibles, Nehemiah 4. And we're going to read through. We've got a little chunk this morning. It's entitled, Opposition to the Work. Now, when Sanballat heard that, he, that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and bird, burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Yes, what they are building. If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O oh God, for we are despised. This is Nehemiah. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall. And all the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashadites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set up a guard as protection against them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we will, ne we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we are come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us 10 times, you must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. You get a sense that this is a really serious, weighty moment for the rebuilding team, don't you? Up until this point, there's been little, uh, there's been little oppositions, there's been challenges They've had to put plans in place. Some of the challenges have been trying to stir up the nobles, if you remember last week. But now it's like op opposition has come right full in their face. Mike Tyson has landed the first blow. So we're going to look at three things as we unpack this bit of scripture. My hope is it's going to be practical and useful. It's going to equip us and ready us. The first is the differing oppositions. First is the different types of opposition. Secondly, opposition's traps that we might fall into. And thirdly, opposition is not the final word. Amen? I think our Christian walk can sometimes be kind of related to a team sport. If you've ever played rugby or football, hockey, basketball, netball, then you'll know that when you gather as a team, you often do away games. And when you turn up, and you see that there is no opposition, the first thing through your mind is not, oh, great, we're going to have a brilliant game today. This is going to be effective. We're going to do well together. Your first thought is probably, we must be in the wrong place. <laughs> we've gone to the wrong place. We're supposed to be playing against another team. Oh, no, we've done it again. Or maybe uh, they've called the game off and they never told us what's going on here. Or maybe actually was it at home. But your first thought is not, oh, there's no opposition. This should be a really good game. And I think actually in Christian life, we so want there to be no opposition. 
We so don't like the fact that there's opposition that if we could just have it a bit easier sometimes, we would be more than happy with that. If we could just somehow mediate all the different oppositions and, and just get through without any conflict and without anyone really noticing us. I used to feel like I wanted to be a chameleon at work. I used to think this thought. I remember in one small group someone saying, what animal would you like to be? I was like, I want to be a chameleon. I just want to blend in. I do not want to stand out. I don't want to be having to raise my voice. I don't want to be having to say, actually, I don't believe that. Or I, I actually think maybe God wants this. I don't want to do it. I just want to blend in. And I think so often in the West, more than perhaps anywhere else, we just want to blend in to our culture. But that's not, that's not what we've born, been born into. That is not the kingdom of life. Friends, we just have to get... To, we just get over the fact that if we have been born again, if we're Christians, we are in opposition. It's not when opposition may come. We're in opposition not because of anything you have done, but because of what Christ has done to stand up against hell, against Satan. We are therefore in opposition. And perhaps if you've not experienced any opposition to your faith in a long time, we actually need to ask, am I walking the gospel that I've been given? Am I standing up for what Christ has given me? I mean, his example was very much there is going to be opposition. And he said, if you follow me, there will be troubles. Paul's example was very much, Peter's example was, et cetera, et cetera. And if we have found ourselves in a place of real peace with everyone around us and no one seems to know, and we just, we just shy away whenever opposition seems to flare up, can I suggest that's maybe not the gospel of Jesus Christ? We are in opposition. The different types of opposition are important to understand, though, because it's true God sometimes may feel like he is opposing your plans and purposes. Every now and again, you may get this. I I remember, for me, um, there was one situation in the morning. I'd got up early reading my Bible, and what I read that morning was in direct opposition to what I was doing at that time. Man, it was like opposition, but it was from God. God was challenging and he was opposing what I was doing and I needed to recognise that. It would have been no good for me to go, oh, I will overcome this opposition. Firstly, no, you won't, Dan. It's God. (laughs) That's never going to happen. But secondly, his opposition comes so that we might know life to the full. And if we're not experiencing it, he will bring that up with us. When David had committed adultery, we read in 2 Samuel 12, Nathan actually comes, can you imagine this moment, coming to the king, Nathan the prophet comes into his presence and he opposes what David has done. It would have been no good if David had said, no, what I have done, this adultery that's hidden and I'm going to justify it and I'm going to... That would not have done David any good. No, it was good that God opposed him and challenged him because he was brought back into a relationship with God. So we need to be able to discern, is this God or is this not Is this opposition from God or is this actually from somewhere else? You're going to see some of the revealing hallmarks that Satan leaves when he opposes you. We're going to see this from Nehemiah because it it often looks similar. It just manifests over the years in slightly different ways. So let me read again. Um, Nehemiah 4, now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall. He was angry and greatly enraged and he jeered at the Jews and he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? So firstly, when Satan opposes God's plans and the people of God, you will notice that there is often this anger and rage. He incenses people. Like Sam Ballot and Tobiah, It's a different nation. What's what's it to do with them? Maybe there's going to be a challenge. Maybe they just don't like... No, but they're incensed. They're enraged by this. Satan often overplays his hand in this way. He often comes in so heavy that he's going to squash any hope of people relying on God. Anger and rage is one of the signs that Satan is opposing us. You'll notice from history that the devil does this again and again. Uh, You know, perhaps think of... A couple of examples that I can think of. Esther 3. Remember the story of Haman. Haman, this guy that has heard that Mordecai won't bow to the king. And and he gets so enraged. He doesn't just want to destroy Mordecai and that man of God. 
He wants to destroy all of the Jews because of this, the whole nation. He gets so enraged. So it says, yet, having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy, to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. This kind of enrage and, and anger, you'll notice as a bit of a sign that Satan is a, is a part of it. It's totally unreasonable. It's totally overcooked. It's like someone's done something small and he comes in with a sledgehammer. It's, it's so overdone. Think of Hitler with the Jews. It, it plays out again and again through history. Why is he so enraged by this people? They, from miles away, they've done nothing against, and yet he's, his focus of his rage and anger is upon them. When I was a teenager, I came upon this. I'd, I'd invited one of my friends to Alpha, just trying to land this and how we, we may experience it. I'd invited a friend to Alpha, and it had gone really well. And actually, he was just like, this is amazing. I've never been taught this. And, so he, and I was just like, I was bubbling with it then. I was like, wow, amazing. What I've experienced is what he's experienced. That's so good. So then I invited a couple more friends. And uh, we're on our way to the pub one day. I remember it in the car. I said, oh, guys, um, I just invited Phil. And I was wondering, you know, he's really enjoyed it. Would you guys like to come to Alpha? It's where you get to explore Christianity and what it means. There's no pressure, but you'll understand what I believe. And, you know, you might, you might find it interesting. And it wasn't just that they said, oh, no, not really interested in that, Dan. They got super angry with me. They were, they were like, it was like this, this rage at, that I would impose my Christian beliefs on them. And it, they just got so, and I was like, whoa, I just invited you to a meal and to find out about it. And I tried, you know, I thought you'd enjoy it, but, and they just got so angry. The whole evening was completely tainted by this. It was like, how dare you do this? How dare you impose your beliefs in this way? It was, it just got fiercely angry. I thought, when I came away, I thought, that was totally unreasonable. They're, they're reasonable, nice guys. I'm friends, my friends are nice. <laughs> but the rage that they showed was totally different to the friends I knew. I'd never seen it before. Ah, there must be something else going on. This is one of the ploys that the enemy uses. He stirs up an anger and rage at God's people. And it's totally unreasonable. The point is, the opposition to God's work, to God's people on earth always has a source that goes beyond the natural. It's not that my friends were just inherent, they had such bad experiences with Christianity, they were like, we hate this. No, they, they had no experiences. No, opposition always has its roots when it's against God somewhere beyond the natural. Satan is at work. He's stirring up. He's, he's doing something behind the scenes, and we need to recognise that. Dark powers that hate God and his work and do not want humankind to come into freedom and enjoyment and the fullness of life that God promises. They do, the, the, the hell does not want us to know the love of God, and so it comes heavy against it. Secondly, so as number one, there's often, if, if you see opposition, it's, it's often totally outbalances what you thought was reasonable. There's often such anger and rage at the very thought. Secondly, there's, there's jeering going on. We read in the story, uh, it says that Sanballat, he was angry and greatly enraged and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers, so he's got people around him that are on his side, if you like, and in the presence of the army of Samaria. He jeers in the presence of both. And this is often a play that bullies use. They're in a position of strength. They've got people around them that agree with them, like-minded. And they will not only oppose someone, but they'll do it in front of their friends if they see that they're in a place of power. They'll do it in front of their own people, but also in front of some of your friends as well. And maybe you've experienced this before. When I was a carpenter on site, again, just to give you a real life, and you might go, ah... Oh, that reminds me. I was on site, and if I was having one-on-one -on -one conversations with folk, we always got onto God. I wasn't bringing it up. They were. There was just a real interest. One-on-one, -on -one, they would ask, so, so how does it affect this area of your life? And, and when did you first, you know, they were, they were so interested. Exactly the same people, if they were all together, would jeer. It's like, what? We were talking about this five minutes ago. Come on, and, and now, you're, now you're mocking me. 
I would turn up on site and they'd be singing Amazing Grace from the scaffolding. Not because they wanted me to join in and lead them. You know, that wasn't, that wasn't the purpose. When they got together, there was something of jeering that came out, and yet one-on-one there was interest. And I never understood this until I read here in Nehemiah, Sam Ballot, in front of his people, changes what he does. He suddenly has the boldness to jeer and in front of others that Nehemiah knew. And this may be a tactic that the enemy uses. Maybe it's when you're at work and everyone's around and someone in front of your colleagues over lunch says, don't you go to church? You're like, we've been working together all morning. Why didn't you ask that before? And it's, it's sort of changed. Or maybe you've experienced it at school. It's like, why does it seem to come up when, it's, when there's pressure on the moment, you know? I'm at a party and some of my friends have had a drink and suddenly they decide to bring this up and have a go at me. Why does that happen? Well, because opposition against God's people always has its root beyond the natural. Nehemiah and the people of God experience anger, rage, jeering in front of others, opposition from, uh, Nehemiah experiences opposition from his own nobles, Nehemiah experiences assassination attempts, he experiences the threat of battle, and he experiences threats to their own families. All of these are happening as forms of opposition in this bit of scripture. When God opposes our lifestyle, so when God is opposing us, he does so in love. You'll know the voice because he doesn't condemn. He doesn't shame you. He doesn't jeer. He never mocks or taunts his children. That's not, that's not God's voice. He never causes harm. Instead, his voice is laced with love and grace, even if he is saying, I want you to stop doing that. I heard someone just the other day, I was at a conference and they said, isn't God amazing? And we all went, yes, he is. And and this person went on and said, I could take a thousand steps away from him. I turn around and take one towards him and there he is. And we went, yeah, isn't God amazing? You could have taken a thousand steps away from him. And he's saying, please, and you know God's opposing your choices. You know God's opposing your lifestyle or what you're doing in the secret place. I'm telling you, if you take, turn around and take one step towards him, there he is. Because that's our God. That's what he does. He doesn't jeer or taunt. He doesn't, you know, here's all the things you've done. No, all of his challenges are laced with love. And that's the difference between God's opposition and Satan's. Another ploy that the enemy will use that we read about here. Uh, so Sam Ballot speaking. Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, yes, what they're building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone walls. Might not sound like a great threat or jeer. If a fox goes up on it, you might think, what? But I think probably if you're in this situation, man, it's coming across just horribly. Notice how these words from Sam Ballot and Tobiah then appear in the Israelites' language later on. So this is one of, the, one of the ploys that Satan will use. He will try to get you to agree with him in what he's saying. So you remember what Sam Ballot's been saying? If a fox goes up, oh, uh, you're going to revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish, the burn ones at that. This is what they're saying at the people of God. Later on, this is what the people of God say. In Judah, it was said... The strength of those who hear, who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. Do you hear what's going on? In their language, they're starting to agree with what the opposition has been saying to them. They're starting to align themselves with opposition. And we need to be really wary of this. Sometimes we can slip out with things that actually aren't true. The enemy might have been accusing you for a long time and you begin to align your thinking with what the enemy says. How could God love me? He must must think I'm ridiculous. I'm I'm not a real Christian. This is how I live. And you start aligning with what the enemy taunts you with. If we're not careful, we can pick up on the doubts and fears that are being thrown our direction. And we can begin projecting that by accident. What do we see Nehemiah do to confront this one? He prays. He prays and he says the prayers, uh, no, he prays um, afterwards and I, I was, as he was praying, I was thinking of uh, in James where it says the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. 
This is what Nehemiah does in response. He's heard the taunts. The people have started regurgitating what the enemy's been speaking over them. But Nehemiah prays. And I was just thinking, yeah, James picks up on this, doesn't he, in his book. The prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. James then gives an example of Elijah, where he prays for no rain. Wow. And then he prays for rain and rain comes. And we see the prayers of a righteous person that are powerful and effective. James says, you and I are men and women just like Elijah. Your prayers are powerful. The first line of defence and attack that you can use is to pray. You have no idea the power of your prayers, uh, of the prayers you have, if you would stop agreeing with and aligning yourself with the enemy and instead come to the word of God that confronts the enemy. That's how things will change because this is it. By doing so, by praying, you involve dad in the matter. You know, (laughs) like kids when they're little and they're playing in the playground. My dad's bigger than yours. My dad does this. And you start praying, you involve dad and he's massive. And that's what we do when we pray. So don't align yourselves. Number four, some things are true, but not true. So it says, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish? It's kind of true, but it's not true. Are they going to try and finish it in a day? Well, no, it takes 52 days. You unpick some of these lies and, and there's kind of truth in there. Will they do it in a day? But it's laced with mistruths as well. Paul the Apostle was once accused of being a murderer. Now, I remember preaching on this and someone, uh, Callum Cookman, came up afterwards and he said, what struck me with this scripture is that Paul could have said, yes, I am, and been totally flattened by that accusation, he's a murderer. Because if you remember in Paul's history, when he's Saul, he oversaw the murder and killing of Christians. And so when he's accused later on in his ministry, you're a murderer, cool, couldn't that have hurt? Oh, yeah, I am. You're right. Who am I? What have I done? but he doesn't align with that. I've been set free. God has done such a work in me that that's no longer longer who I am. I am who Christ says I am. I'm found in him. So Paul finds this one as well. Something might be thrown at you that's kind of true, but not true, is what I'm saying. I've said before in this forum that uh, part of my history, my, my sort of walk before God and in God is that I had an addiction to porn and it was something that was so hidden in my life and it caused such like just horrible hidden places it was something I was extremely shameful of how in the world can you go to church and then explain that like the two just didn't go together it's like two people and as a Christian there's always shame and fear about what the enemy accuses us with and what I had to start doing was I had to start believing what God said about me Because he could always accuse that about me in my past. And it was true. But it's also not true because of the work of Christ in my life. The enemy, if you're trying to break free from something, maybe an addiction in your life, maybe there's something going on that's hidden. The hidden things are always the ones that seem to last the longest because to bring them to light is a a costly thing. But there's there's always grace when you do. But if you're trying to break free from it, it's not like the enemy goes, ah, lost cause with Dan because he's obviously determined you know he's actually made a decision to want to break free from porn in his life so okay we'll leave him alone that's not what the enemy says the enemy brings up stuff in your life he says are you really broken free last time you tried to break free from this how long did it take two weeks a month hey Dan maybe you even made a year but in the end you still tripped up didn't you these are the kind of lies that you believe or the kind of lies that are thrown at you, if you're trying to break free from something, because the enemy doesn't go, oh, wow, they're they're integrity on this one. You know, they're really sincere about breaking free or changing their lifestyle in this way. Oh, wow, we can't do anything with this one. No, just reminds you, haven't you tried this before? Did God actually break you free the first time, or did you actually slip back into it, Dan? Wow, true, but not true, right? And you see the power that can have in our lives. One day I decided enough's enough. If God was going to get, set me free, if God had set me free, I was going to be free indeed. It's enough of listening to that. I'm going to be free indeed and I'm going to keep on stepping towards Christ. We've got to bring it to life. Maybe for you it's around gossip. 
Maybe for you, that's the kind of thing. It's like, if I'm going to slip, I'm going to slip into gossip. And I know I'm doing it when I'm doing it, but for some reason, it's just it's so tasty to want to just ask those questions that I know are going to provide me with gossip. Maybe it's lying. Maybe you don't know why, but just when you're asked a straight question, you can't help but lie. It's like you just make something up and it would have been easier to tell the truth and yet you find lies coming out of your mouth. Maybe it's gambling or idolising money. Fame or position is just the things that keep coming up and the enemy is not going to just let you go because you're sincere about wanting to follow Christ now. No, he's going to oppose it. But that does not mean he has only power to do anything about it when you pray A prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So it's not when we're in opposition. It's not when might this happen. We are in opposition as believers. The very fact that you've been saved from darkness and born into light, you now oppose darkness if you're in light. It's not when, it is now. There's this thing that um, Nehemiah does, which the, the, which the devil hates, and God's people were doing. Um, and it's, it's the fact that God's people keep on coming to him that the, de- that the devil hates. So I want us to look at some, some mechanisms we can apply, learning from Nehemiah, at how to overcome opposition in our life. Opposition can look so broad in our lives. If in doubt, assume that maybe the enemy wants to accuse you and come back with some of these things. So how to overcome hell's opposition? And it revolves around this phrase, is Jesus God? I'm not going to give you 10 things to make you work harder, 10 things that you need to apply in your life if you really want to see God breaking through. I just want to remind you of what is already true and then get you to place your faith in that thing. And I believe you're going to see some of these oppositions just drop away and their voices and the power it has over you fade away. So it says, this is Nehemiah, and I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Did you hear that? Nehemiah says, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. It's like saying to a small boy who is being bullied at school, don't don't worry about being bullied at school because Arnold Schwarzenegger is really strong. Like, what's the link? I'm at school. I want to be really strong to deal with the bullies. What's the link between me and Arnie? I know he's really strong. What the issue is that I'm not really strong. That's the problem. And it's kind of like Nehemiah does that. They're being opposed. And Nehemiah, instead of saying, but look how strong we are. We're doing so well, guys. You're doing so well. He says, look at how strong God is. Do you get what he does then? We're always tempted when opposition comes to just either flight or fight or fold or, you know, faint or whatever the other ones are. But we first need to ask this question, is Jesus God? He'll change everything. John the Baptist, little example, I'll just quickly go over. John the Baptist, is, um, he's the one that brings Jesus in. He kind, of, he, he kind of ordains Jesus as the son of God, doesn't he, at the baptism moment where he says, there's the Lord. And, but the rest of John the Baptist's life doesn't actually pan out how he thought he would. You see, in the back of John the Baptist's mind is Isaiah 61, which talks about how Jesus will set the prisoner free. He'll heal the blind. He'll set the captives free. You know, this is what John the Baptist has got in his mind when the Messiah comes. And so John the Baptist says, That's, Jesus is the Messiah. Now, John the Baptist later on ends up in prison. Herod imprisons him. And, and he finds, when he's in prison, this doubt come in. Huh? The Messiah was supposed to mean I wouldn't be in prison. He was supposed to set the captives free, and yet here I am stuck in prison. Oh, no. Is he really God? And so he sends some of his disciples to Jesus to say, kind of, how can I be sure? So now when John heard in prison, this is from Matthew 11, when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? The doubting. Oh, my goodness. See, John the Baptist is being opposed at this point. And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Here's the thing. Jesus could have said, 
go back to John and tell him he knows I'm the one because I told him I am. You know, go, go and remind him, go and tell him that. Instead, what Jesus does is he takes him back to scripture and he says, this is what is true. These are the signs that will accompany the Messiah. Go and tell him what you've seen. Am I doing this or not? So John was able to say himself, ah, oh, yes, Jesus is God. You see what Jesus did? He enables John to get there himself. Jesus could have just said, you know I'm God. I told you I'm God. But he doesn't do that. He reveals to John the Baptist, I am God. And that enables John, even in the tough times, to go, okay, Jesus is God. Maybe you were mocked for your faith. You need to ask the question, is Jesus God? If he is, it changes the situation you're in. If he is, in fact, God, then everything is different. If he is, in fact, God, then he will strengthen you as you are tested. If you're tempted to sin once again, like I talked about earlier, then you need to ask the question, is Jesus God? If he isn't God, then yeah, it's true. All of these things I'm being accused of, I will fold under. But if he is God, he is strong to save. And I find myself in him. If he's God, then I'm able to continue. If family hate you because of what you believe or friends oppose you, then it's not just you need to work on your techniques for sharing the gospel. No, you need to remind yourself, is Jesus God? If he is who he said he was, then there is strength found in that place and he will indeed help you because he has power to do so. If he's not, then he can't. Do you see, the question really comes down to, is Jesus who he said he was? We can sometimes get caught up in different techniques where we try harder, build up muscle ourselves, but do what Nehemiah does. Point to God. Say, we've got this opposition, but God is mighty to save and he will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear because he always provides a way of escape. So let me remind you how it finishes. Next week, we're going to look at revival sound, the sound of revival. God rebuilds for a purpose, friends. He's rebuilding his church at the moment after COVID for a glorious purpose. And I want to excite us next week for what this purpose is. But let me remind you, the wall gets finished. And this is just kind of a, a beautiful picture. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Eliel, in, the, in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid, and they fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of God. We don't just push through. They, they perceived this had been accomplished with the help of God band would you guys come up and we're going to worship maybe if you've been experiencing some opposition maybe you didn't know it might have actually been opposition it's just been really tough at the moment for you and you thought oh it's just tough it's not just tough it's because you believe in God it's because you profess Jesus is Lord and and that means you're in light which means darkness opposes you and you need to remind yourself who he is I want us to do that in worship it's the greatest thing we can do as Christians Sometimes we get caught up in all the activity, but actually just to remind ourselves who God is. Is Jesus who he said he is? So in worship, I want to encourage us to do that. Discern who's opposing you when you come up against opposition. Is this God or is this actually not God? They sound very different. Beware who you agree with as you face opposition. Don't just agree with everything that gets thrown at you. You'll start speaking it out. The smartest opposition that Satan often use is to distort truth. It's kind of true, but it's not true. Remind yourself what the word of God says. And most importantly, friends, ask the question, is Jesus God? Because if he is, that changes everything. Amen? Amen. Shall we stand and worship? Oh, Heavenly Father. I thank you that time and time again, whenever I face opposition, and, and I'm sure many of us can uh, experience this as well, when we come to, is God who he said he was? We say, yes. This is really tough right now, but Jesus is God. And if he is God, then he provides strength. He provides a way out of temptation. He will give me the strength to stand up under this. He'll give me the words to say. He will give me grace every single day that I live on this earth. Thank you, God. Amen. Hey, my name's Dan Baptist and I'm lead pastor here at Jubilee Community Church. We really hope that something from this morning's word has 
blessed you and reached you. And if you'd like to talk about anything you've heard or just be able to talk about maybe faith or get some prayer, then please get in contact. You can email us, give us a call at the centre and one of the team's going to get back to you. We'd love to do this, especially if you're just thinking about what it is to become a Christian. You want to sit down and really talk that through with anyone. We also run regularly on a Sunday some joining the church courses. And if you want to know more about Jubilee Community Church and what it is to belong here, then you can just uh, find out online when the next one of those is going on and you can attend, have a meal, sit down, talk about it. We also have some amazing midweek group life uh, where it's a great opportunity to dig further into your faith. Again, you can find out that on our website too. Anyway, just wanted to say hi and uh, bless you and we'll catch up soon.